little bit about Dorsey Asset Management, uh, the firm that I run right now. We're about three years, just to give you some context for what I'm about to talk about for the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Um, we launched about three years ago. Uh, we're about 250 million in assets under management. Um, we have three research professionals uh, and a CFO, COO. We're very concentrated, 10 to 15 positions, uh, global mandates, so we can invest anywhere in the world. Uh, and we look for businesses with competitive advantages, runways for reinvestment, and strong capital allocation. And I want to spend just a moment on that because it's, a big, it's a important for framing uh, my discussion over the next 30 minutes or so. Um, unlike some firms, which really focus more on mature firms with established moats, we're much more focused on firms that are still building their moats, firms that are reinvesting capital back into the business. Because in our view, the value of an economic moat, of a competitive advantage, is maximized when you can reinvest back into the business. If my end market is only growing 3 or 4%, and I've got to spit out all the cash to you, the shareholder, that's really nice, but I'm not maximizing the value of my competitive advantage. If my end market is growing very quickly and I can reinvest back into the business at a high 20, 30, 40% incremental rate of return, that's when you get Lollapaloozas. That's when you get the value of the moat being really maximized. And those are the kinds of businesses that myself and my colleagues focus on. And so that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk a little bit about economic moats. Um, I recognize a lot of familiar faces here. And so you will be very happy to know that I'm not repeating the same thing I did the past couple of years, kind of try to rip through that reasonably quickly. Because what I want to spend more time on is capital allocation. I think capital allocation, frankly, is kind of underthought about and under-discussed because people just sort of blithely say, oh, Tom, you know, Malone is a great capital allocator. Okay, great. Well, what does that mean? And how do you find great capital allocators without waiting for them to compound capital for 40 or 50 years? I think that would be sort of useful, uh, since none of us have the Wayback Machine and can go back and invest with those folks 40, 50 years ago. So I want to spend a fair amount of time talking about capital allocation and identifying the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, in that field. So economic moats. Uh, basics here, capitalism works. Uh, high profits attract competition. If I gave each of you 10 million bucks and said go start a business, you would not go start a newspaper or a buggy whip business. You would go start, sorry Warren, I know he owns a newspaper. Um, you would go out and invest in businesses or start a business that's doing really well, that's generating high returns. So you can compete with those and bring them down. Intuitively this makes sense. Empirically it is also true. If you take large data sets of, of businesses, uh, you know, the CSFB Holt one is probably one of the better ones. Look at you know, the top quintile or decile of returns on capital at T1, roll the clock forward to T10, T20, T30. Generally speaking, those businesses will have lower returns on capital as competition has come in and taken away their excess profits. Um, we also know, however, that, of course, a small minority of businesses basically defy economic gravity. They enjoy many, many years of high returns on capital, and I argue that they do this by creating economic moats, structural competitive advantages, things that are inherent to the business. So why moats matter is very simple, because an extended period of high returns on capital increases business value by lengthening the period during which capital can be reinvested. So conceptually, the wide moat business here has all this time to reinvest capital back into the business at a high rate of return, right? The no moat business has only a few years before somebody shows up, knocks off their product, copies what they're doing, and they no longer have that opportunity to reinvest. So very simply, the PV of current cash flow tends to be higher here because your duration of excess profits, the duration of the period during which you can reinvest is longer. It's not infinite, and you can still overpay for these things, but empirically, businesses with moats that have that reinvestment period, you can pay an optically higher multiple today and still generate a higher return than paying a lower multiple for the business with a very short reinvestment period. So, I want to briefly talk about some different types of competitive advantage before I talk about capital allocation. These are the four kinds of moats that we uh, distilled down at Morningstar after looking at, lordy, uh, tens of thousands of businesses over about a 40-year period. Just empirically looked at the ones that had generated returns on capital of 15% or better for a 15-year stretch or more. So basically, 
They've done it. They've defied economic gravity. And then what are their common characteristics? And these were the most common characteristics we found. So brands are pretty obvious, but I think it's important to understand what kind of brand you're paying for. So a brand can lower search costs. I grab a bud because I think it tastes good. God forbid why I would think it tastes good. Uh, but I do, and I recognize the label, and I grab it. Uh, I use Tide because P&G's immense marketing budget has convinced me it cleans better than anything else, which is not true, uh, and one reason why their next 10 years are going to be tough for them, but there we are. Um, brands can create positional value, right? The Rolex watch does not tell time any differently than the Mickey Mouse watch I had as a kid. It's the same time, gang. But, of course, it, what it signals to people is that I have a lot of money, right? And so, well, right, I mean, that's what it signals. I have a lot of money. I am successful. Um, there's probably an evolutionary thing with mating behavior that we could get into. Um, you know, it's like a peacock. Um, or they can confer legitimacy. So you think of GFK, you think of Nielsen's, you think of Moody's. You know, Pat Dorsey's bond rating service isn't worth, you know, a pound of nothing. Um, a bond rating from Moody's is worth a lot, right? An audience measurement from Nielsen is worth a lot. An audience measurement from Bob Miles' audience measurement service, sorry, Bob, is not worth very much. So the brand can confer legitimacy. Now, you also have patents and licenses and approvals, which are other types of intangible assets that confer moats. But I want to spend a minute on the brand thing, because I think it's really, really important to think about right now, especially. So positional and legitimacy brands are based on strong social consensus. Cartier, Rolex, have positional value because there is a social consensus that agrees that they do, right? And so if I say, well, I don't really think Cartier is very nice, but I want to signal to people that I have a lot of money, and I buy an unheard of luxury brand, that signaling isn't going to be as strong because, frankly, you don't all necessarily agree with me. Uh, Nielsen. If I decide that Nielsen is not a very good measurement of audience, but I'm trying to, you know, basically, let's say I'm a media company trying to sell to advertisers, and I say, wow, this new upstart audience measurement that you've never heard of, it's a lot better. Yeah, so what? Show me the Nielsen numbers, right? That social consensus has to break down for the moat to break down. Big, big difference with low search cost brands. If I suddenly decide that I can get a razor from Dollar Shave Club a lot cheaper than Gillette, and it does the same job as the one from Dollar Shave Club, I get full value from that product without any of you having to change your mind, right? So the, my ability to defect has way less cost for me. And fragmentation of mass media has dramatically lowered the cost of reaching a mass market. Dollar Shave started with a $5,000 YouTube video. Or it might even be less. If none of you have seen the original Dollar Shave YouTube video, please do. It's amazing, and it's one of the things that made the company worth a billion bucks in five years when uh, Unilever, Unilever? Yeah, Unilever bought it recently. Um, and so this was not possible 15 years ago, right? If I wanted to create mass, a, a mass brand, I had to go to CBS, ABC, NBC, and pay a lot of money for an ad on Seinfeld, or Oprah, or Days of Our Lives. Now, I create a YouTube video. That's a much, much lower barrier to entry. Moreover, I can use tools like Facebook and Google to target extremely effectively. And so challenger brands like Dollar Shave and Chobani do not require a change in social consensus to deliver full value to the new user, the person who tries Chobani or Dollar Shave for the first time. And so I would ask you, and to think about this very carefully, how inevitable are the inevitables? I think this is something that if you are a big CPG investor in consumer product companies, you need to think about this really carefully. And now I'm not saying go out and put your life savings shorting Unilever right now, gang. I'm simply saying think about it. Because the barriers to entry for creating a mass brand are dramatically lower today than they were over the past 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Switching costs are just what they sound like when it costs more for the user to switch to the competitor than to stay with the incumbent. You have this typically more prevalent in B2B um, because it's integrated with a business process. If you try to rip out an Oracle database, you're essentially ripping out the beating heart of a business. Uh, very difficult thing to do, so Larry Ellison just raises prices a little bit every year, goes by a bigger yacht every year. 
or invests in a new um, you know, tennis uh, uh, tournament. If you haven't been to Indian Wells, it's pretty amazing. I mean, what he's done with Indian Wells. Uh, there's a little bit of social good there, perhaps less so with the big boats that he buys. Um, you also have this with products with high benefit cost ratios. Any of you familiar with Christian Hansen in Denmark? Wow, it's like one of the modiest business in the world. All right, one of you, good point. Points for the guy in the back. Um, so Christian Hansen is about 70% uh, global market share in dairy cultures. Woohoo, dairy cultures. Um, but of course, without a dairy culture, milk doesn't become yogurt. Milk doesn't become cheese. And the culture has a huge impact on the shelf life of the yogurt or cheese, the taste, the feel in your mouth. But because it's a biological process, the culture you use if the cow is eating silage of one type in the US is very different than the culture you might want to use in France or in other parts of the world. And dairies are continuous process. There's constantly milk coming in, so you can't just shut down if it doesn't work. It's got to continuously work. So a culture is about 2.5% of the cost of goods uh, making yogurt or cheese. Your switching costs are immensely high, and so they're able to raise prices every single year. And you have this huge mismatch between the cost to the input and the value in terms of the output, you tend to get very high switching costs. Network effects are just what they sound like. When the, product, the value of a product or service increases as the number of users expands, they're maintained by subsidizing one side of the network. Right? None of you pay for Adobe Reader. Right? You can get Adobe Reader for free. But if you want to create a PDF or manipulate a PDF, you've got to pay Adobe some money. So they subsidize one side of the network. Same thing with Uber. Uber, when it moves into a new city, subsidizes the cars. They'll guarantee a minimum wage, a minimum payment for the vehicles. Why? Because you're not going to pull up your app and use Uber if there are no Ubers around. So they subsidize one side of the network, and then once they have lots of people driving, they pull away the subsidies and everybody screams. Um, but that's how you build a network. Also, driving engagement. If Facebook today were the same Facebook as five years ago, with no live video, no new features, you wouldn't be as interested. You have to continuously keep people engaged in your network. Network effects are destroyed when pricing power is abused. Bloomberg is the canonical example here. That is incredibly abusive when it comes to pricing. And so the more you abuse price, the higher you raise the ceiling and the margins, and the more possibility you give the competitor to come in. Or if the user experience degrades. As you may know, MySpace and Orkut in Brazil were much, much bigger than Facebook. Uh, for the early years of Facebook's life. And one of the reasons, there were many, that they declined was that the user experience degraded. They didn't invest in servers. When News, when, uh, News Corp bought MySpace, they plastered ads all over the place. The user experience stunk. And so I said, let me try this new Facebook thing. If they had kept that user experience, you know, peri pursue with Facebook, the incentive to switch would have been much lower. Cost advantages are just what they sound like. Um, you know, uh, but what I want to point out here is I think a type of cost advantage that people don't pay a lot of attention to, which is when you dominate an industry with a very high market share relative to the total addressable market. There are some markets that are so small, niche markets, that they'll only profitably support one or two players. Okay? And so the, a new entrant would have to invest so much to come in and start a product that they would drive returns down for everybody in the market. Uh, and so this is an insanely profitable area for businesses. Uh, Spirex Sarcos is a, a UK company that specializes in steam. Wow, doesn't sound very exciting, but steam is highly, highly expensive to produce because it's very energy intensive. And so if you can reduce the cost of making steam for a uh, food process or disinfecting, you can save people a lot of money. And they are the global specialists in steam. Not an end market that's growing very fast, but one that allows high 20s operating margins very, very consistently. Let's talk about management for a minute. Management, sorry, Warren, is not a moat. But management's actions create, preserve, widen, and destroy moats. Moats should always drive strategy. From day one, Amazon has been about improving the customer experience. Bloomberg, increase user switching costs. Continue encroaching into your life with Excel APIs and everything else that makes it difficult to switch. Uber, increase vehicle liquidity. Howden's Joinery, a small company in the UK that we own. Solve the builder's problems. Facebook, drive user engagement. The point here is that if you're investing in a business and you think they have a moat and management strategy is not centered around widening that moat, 
they're probably at risk for disruption. So let's talk a little bit about capital allocation, which is the link between business value and shareholder value. Capital is uh, deployed destructively. Shareholders don't benefit from increased business value, right? The business value grows, but if that cash is taken and spent on stupid acquisitions or overpriced stock or whatever it might be, value gets vaporized. You, the shareholder, do not benefit from the full value of the business, in, in, the full amount of business value increasing. Now, the converse is that when you get intelligent buybacks, you get value accretive M&A, shareholder value actually can increase faster than business value. The share count shrinks at good prices. And so, in that case, there's not leakage, but there's actual amplification of the returns you receive. So, I think this is really important to think about. Um, so, let's get some ground rules on capital allocation. Usually, and I think, I mean, 90% of the CEOs I talk to would agree with this. Growth is good. Organic growth is always good. Buybacks, buybacks are awesome. Dividends are great. Especially, and we'll get to this, there are certain countries that have what I call the dividend fetish. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But these are always good things, right? Which is totally freaking wrong. All three destroy value. If you're plowing back money into the business and organic growth, sub cost of capital, that's stupid. If you're making acquisitions and your hurdle rate is you know, a whack that's depressed by generationally low interest rates, that's dumb. If you're paying out 50% of your capital when you could be reinvesting it back into the business at a high rate of return, or you fund the dividend with equity raises, which is like, I mean, hello, that's dumb too. M&A is usually a destructive use of capital, right? This is B-School 101. Big mergers are bad. We have giant McKinsey studies that show mergers destroy value. Well, no, uh, not always. Um, always is a very dangerous word in this profession, I find. There's this huge right tail of companies, right? This is your right, this is my right, okay. There's this huge right tail of companies that have built huge value via intelligent M&A. M&A can be massively, massively valuable if carried out with discipline and intelligently. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the ways, I, th I think, to sort kind of the, the idiots from the ones who actually create value. Um, an accretive capital allocation requires discipline and focus. This is the critical thing. The fact that someone is a good capital allocator or that capital allocation of business is not going to be value destructive for you, the shareholder, this is a thesis that must, a, sorry, a hypothesis that must be proved. It is not something you can assume. You can't assume that capital allocation isn't gonna screw you, because it often does. That's a technical term, CFA level three. <laughs> screw you. Um, so, let's talk about growth for a minute. Obviously, if you have high ROIC investment opportunities, for goodness sake, grow as much as you can. Reinvest heavily. So here's a quote, obviously, when your opportunity set is all of global retail, for God's sake, keep hunting back in the business. But if you can't, don't try. Maturing companies usually keep going for way too long and continue to invest despite declining returns on invested capital. There's a very simple reason for this. There is a linear relationship between the size of the business and CEO pay. There is not a linear relationship between returns on capital and CEO pay. So, I am CEO, I am a self-maximizing individual, I like to line my own pockets in conjunction with my complacent board. It's a conversation on the uh, disgustingness of uh, CEO compensation in the US, which we can have another time. What's my incentive, right? Grow the business, keep growing. Aging is tough for companies as well as people. It's very hard for a business that was a growth business that made a CEO who made tons of money by growing to suddenly wake up one day and say, wow, I got a bald spot. Not great. A little harder to get out of bed in the morning. Kind of hurts. Those new stores, not generating the returns on capital they used to. Hey, Wall Street, we're going to slow down square footage growth. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to admit this. I mean, the list is so long of companies that just kept going and going and going and just hit this wall and then had to retrench and begin returning capital. This is my favorite example, uh, Phoebe uh, Novakovic, her first earnings call at General Dynamics. Uh, those of you who don't know the GD story, it's an amazing one. Uh, Nick Chabria took it over and basically shrunk it to greatness, and then uh, somehow, I can't remember the story, but a real idiot took it over 
and destroyed capital with a bunch of stupid IT acquisitions. Um, and then Phoebe took it over. Um, and so General Dynamics has a lot of great businesses. One of them uh, is called Electric Boat, and it makes nuclear submarines. This is a Modi business. They are the only one making nuclear submarines. This is a monopoly. It is not a growth business. There are not 30 new nuke subs being built per year, which is probably good for global security. Um, but it's not good for the growth profile of General Dynamics. So some you know, idiot analysts ask her, I guess the question is about the parts of the business you, where you don't have growth. What do you do with those? What do you do with this electric boat thing that has a monopoly but doesn't grow? And she just gave him a smackdown. Well, then you're going to drive earnings in cash, aren't you? There's no point in chasing revenue or pretending you have growth when you don't. I could have crawled through the phone and kissed her. This is what you want. Somebody who knows that when a business is growing and when it's not, and is willing to say, you just drive the cash. Drive for cash and put the money elsewhere. That's the right attitude for a no-growth business. So let's talk about returning capital. Dividends are not a an admission of defeat. They're a declaration of victory. It says, well, I have more money than I know what to do with. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think it's a good thing, right? But how often do you hear companies say, we're a growth company. Growth companies don't pay dividends. It's just, you know, that's when you just like, oh, my car's leaving. My flight's in an hour. I got to go. You know, Hoarding cash, we see as pilloried in the US. I mean, Apple now, I think, can buy most of the S&P 500, um, or like with its cash pile. But there is this, it has this evil twin in Europe and Australia called the dividend fetish, where companies pay dividends when it's just the worst idea possible. Because dividends are not normatively good if they're funded poorly via an equity raise. I got caught in that one once with a company we owned. Or if they represent a large opportunity cost. A great little UK business we were looking at Management had done phenomenal accretive acquisitions, driving high teens returns on capital for 20 years. They pay out 40% dividend. And we asked them point blank. And what I'm expecting is, well, there just aren't that many opportunities each year. So this is the most capital we can put to work and maintain high returns on capital. OK, that's a pretty good reason. The answer, because our shareholders expect it. My response, get new shareholders. But that, that was not the way they wanted to go. Um, now, buybacks. This is an active use of valuable capital, not a passive tool for mollifying shareholders. They should always be driven by an objective assessment of intrinsic value. This is an actual conversation that I had. I am not making this up. CFO. I asked him, so how do you think about buybacks? How do you think about you know, returning capital? Point blank said, we have no opinion about our share's value. This is me. And then he says, that's the job of our shareholders. Every year we ask them, would you prefer a dividend or a buyback? The company is trading at 30 times EV to EV. He has no opinion about the value of his stock? No, he doesn't. And I mean, I sure do. Um, and this isn't, I, I'm not, you can't make this stuff up. They just mechanically buy back stock. It's ridiculous. Now, this is a phenomenal business. It's actually Christian Hansen, the one I thought mentioned before. Phenomenal mode, but I mean just capital allocation that is hard to fathom. So let's talk about M&A for a minute, another major use of capital. M&A should always serve strategic goals, not paper over strategic failures, which is frequently what it does. Microsoft and Aquant, Microsoft buying a digital ad network. Someone explain this to me. Nokia, that was $8 billion down the tube. Daimler, $30 billion. AB and AMRO, $60 billion. Mm-hmm. Eight, autonomy, 18 billion. I mean, just, but all of these, notice all of these were defensive deals. All of these were papering over strategic failures by companies that did not regularly engage in M&A. M&A is a learned skill. It is not something you just do because a great PowerPoint lands on your desk from Merrill Lynch. No offense to anyone here from Merrill Lynch. I could have used any bulge back in front. Um, if M&A is supposed to have a faint hope of creating value, it has to be a central part of management strategy. It requires a disciplined process that is iterated and measured. A few companies that uh, we found that do a phenomenal job with this. But the point is, it's iterated, it's measured, it's part of who they are. They actively work to get better at it. And I'll talk in a few minutes about some specific questions I found valuable in asking management to see whether they, they get it or not. So assessing capital allocation. 
some of the things to think about. You know, has the share count increased, decreased? When did large changes happen? Why? If you're analyzing a business and you look over time and the share count has changed meaningfully and you can't identify why or how, you don't really know anything about capital allocation. M&A, look at the cash flow statement for evidence. How much was paid? What was the result? Again, you have to see what the result was and then go look in the future for write-offs, for discussions about it, because the ones that don't work out, they'll just bury them. Companies will just bury them as much as possible. So you got to go and do the work. You got to go and find out. They laid out 400 million bucks for that business. What did they get from it? Did they learn something from what they did right or did wrong? Did the company ever pay a dividend and raise equity in the same calendar year? Run for the hills. <laughs> Trust me, I should have. It's a bad one. Um, if ROIC is declining, are you seeing capital coming back? Are you seeing the percentage of capital coming back to the shareholders going up as well? You should. Are share repurchases opportunistic or mindlessly regular, like the 30x EV to EBIT dude I talked about a minute ago? Is it discussed explicitly and rationally? Are the words capital allocation even in the annual report? Is this something management knows how to verbalize and discuss? Are there words consistent with actions? This is a big one. Because, you know, after 30 years, people are finally waking up to this dude in Omaha and kind of how he talks about the world. And so you're starting to see Buffett wannabes. You're starting to see people like, you know, talk about, I mean, when present management took over, you know, um, I, you know and, then, and then do things that, I mean, would probably set Buffett's hair on fire uh, in terms of capital allocation. So are the words consistent with the actions? Are the actions and words consistent over time? Critically, what are the CEO's incentive? How does she get paid? Are there any ROI components? I see an ROI component in maybe 10, 15% of the pay packages I look at. Maybe 15%. Is it included in compensation targets? Because if they're being paid on EPS goals or income goals or sales goals and they can just buy it, they will. Because their incentive is to hit the target and get paid. Okay? Oh, here's a great story. So, UK company I met with just uh, last week. Um, uh, I confirmed that M&A, so organic, the, so this, okay, let me try and just describe this right. So, CFO's statement in the annual report, organic growth is one of our core KPIs. Great! Director's remuneration report, no mention of organic growth. Mandy, sorry, her man name was Mandy. Can you explain this to me? Like, this is a core KPI, right? But the directors don't see fit to pay management based on it. You want to help me out? Um, oh, well, we have good corporate governance. And, you know, if we do big M&A and, you know, the organic targets aren't going to be met, um, you know, we adjust. So why don't you just write it into the comp package? Ooh, we're running late. Meeting's over. Yeah, it wasn't that bad, but she, she stopped the meeting pretty quick. Management, managers who are paid handsomely to misallocate capital will do so, period. Incentives matter. So try to lighten things up a little. This is, before we finish up, this is my sort of typical conversation with a CEO. Um, so, sir or ma'am, do you have high ROI investment opportunities? <laughs> Why, yes, of course. We all have high ROI investment opportunities. Now, are you sure? Or is it just really hard to admit that you can't grow at 10% anymore? I'm really sure that's usually the answer, right? You know, and then you say, well, dude, demand is growing 4%. How are you going to grow at 10%? Remember Cisco? Cisco, John Chambers, clung to this 15% growth target like, like it was a life raft for years when the server market was growing at like GDP plus, or the, the router market, rather. And then, this is the answer you get, is if I change my guidance to 4%, our stock would get killed. Now stop asking stupid questions. I know this is the actual conversation. You know, then, okay, so you take a step back. Do you have high ROI investment opportunities? Okay, maybe not anymore. Thanks for being honest. Okay, do you have a coherent strategy to deploy capital with M&A? Someone actually said this to me once. I have an investment banker. <laughs> Sorry to any investment bankers in the audience. You know, that means no, okay? So let's try plan B. This is another actual answer I got once. Paraphrased. I'll create this team with a lot of M&As, a lot of MBAs. We'll do M&A. And our target will be beating our whack in year three. 
in year three. Oh, really? I mean, his whack is like 8%. This is the best you can do? This is your hurdle rate for investing my capital as a shareholder? And then they said, again, literally, this was last week in the UK. What's wrong with an 8% hurdle rate? And I'm not picking on UK managers. I just happened to be there last week. Um, what's wrong with an 8% hurdle rate? Pat, so what's wrong with WAC? How should we choose our hurdle rate? What should it be? Higher was my answer. You know, it, 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 you know it's if you need to ask, right? If you have to ask about the mileage of the Ferrari, you can't afford the Ferrari. Right? If you have to ask why 8% is too low, you shouldn't be allocating people's capital. You should have a different job. So when you're talking to businesses, these are some of the things I found really valuable in elucidating whether management gets it or not. Who in the firm is responsible for capital allocation? Is it the CFO? Is it a finance director? Is it the CEO? It's different. That's fine. But you got it better be a person, one person. What's the hurdle rate? What's been your biggest error? How do you gauge success or failure? How do you measure the process? How do you measure ROI? Which, what's in the R, what's in the I? You can fudge that all you want, right? What have you learned over time? This one's critical. What have you learned? How have you gotten better? And that's when you'll find out if it's a learning organization, right? An organization that learns from its errors, that learns from successes and gets better. Because successful M&A Successful capital allocation is a learned skill. You get better at it over time. So summing up, competitive advantage drives ex the duration of excess ROIC, which drives long-term business value. Capital allocation is the link between business value and shareholder value. It can amplify returns or destroy them. I would argue that Lollapaloozas, the Mungarian Lollapalooza, can't believe I just used Munger as an adjective. That was weird. Um, occur when competitive advantage and capital allocation work together to compound value at high rates. Now, before I finish, this is a very critical point. The outputs of competitive advantage and capital allocation are quantitative. Right? The output is a high ROIC. The output is a shorter share, is a smaller share count. The output is value accretive M&A. But these things all require qualitative evaluation. You cannot screen for switching costs in Bloomberg. And I hope to God you never can, because I will have a much harder time making money. You have to talk to customers and understand the value proposition of the product being offered. You can't assume high market share equates to a cost advantage. You have to unpack the individual unit economics. You cannot trust that management will allocate capital rationally. You have to gather supporting evidence. That means going out, talking to people, digging through past press releases, talking to the management team of the companies they bought, and saying, did they do good diligence on you, or did they do, were they just wanting to get the deal done? That's getting out and talking to people. Because you can't figure this stuff out if you don't turn off your laptop and get out and talk to people. All of the information is in the past, but all of the value is in the future. Quantitative data, I would argue, is usually priced efficiently. And it's getting priced more efficiently every year. Better data sets, faster uh, processors. Qualitative insight is less efficiently priced because it requires real work. It requires sending out 30 emails and getting one person to respond to you. It requires getting out to trade shows and talking on the floor. That's how I would argue you add value. Thanks.